it's 10 o'clock. So, uh, hi, I'm, I'm Patrick uh, Wall. I'm with uh, K Wall, one of the sponsors here. I'm the CTO there. We do primarily Drupal development. And one of the questions people always ask us is how do we, you know, where should we find hosting, good hosting that doesn't, that can expand easily, that doesn't have limitations? And probably our usual response to that is EC2 or cloud somewhere, like uh, Rackspace Cloud or Amazon EC2 or uh, there's various other solutions out there. Uh, and the reason for that is that cloud is easy to make your instance larger and expand your uh, resources that you have to you. Uh, so compared to like shared where you're stuck on a single whatever they give you uh, server. And so I'm just going to define a few quick terms in case someone doesn't, hasn't looked at any cloud stuff before. Uh, instance is basically just a cloud server. It's a single server that's running uh, and just acts like any other server out there. Uh, zone is basically the data center area where the instance is being run. So on Amazon, they have various zones like uh, East Coast, West Coast, uh, some in Asia, things like that. Uh, instance type is essentially what size your instance is, like uh, CPU, RAM, uh, the latency of the hard drive pretty much defines what kind of instance you have. And a reserved instance is just an instance that you have a contract for. So you're paying, with a contract you pay like, uh, you sign up for like a year or three years and you pay X amount in advance and they give you a very reduced price. So if you're planning on hosting for a long period of time, it's definitely worthwhile to do reserved because you will get a lot, it'll probably cut about two thirds of your cost off. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or ask me. Uh, these are the basic instance types in EC2. Uh, micro is the smallest one they have available, and it's 613 megabytes of RAM. It probably would work for a very small site, but nothing that gets too much traffic. Uh, small is the next one up, but the thing to know about that is that it's 32-bit only, so you're not going to be able to upgrade from that very easily because you'll get a server that's 64-bit or 32-bit and you can't get up to the higher, uh, larger, extra-large ones. Large is 7.5 gigabytes of RAM and that's really enough for really a large site. Uh, Extra-large is 15 gigabytes of RAM and that's enough to host like a large amount of large sites. So, um, or just one really, really large site. Um, and they also have high CPU, which really aren't well suited for Drupal because it's more RAM intensive and CPU intensive generally. And high memory, if you were really crazy about having one instance running a huge amount of memory. And they also have like cluster and even further bigger ones, but I'm not even going to go into those because those will get. Uh, yeah. Yeah, if you want a single point of failure, you can go really big. You get one really big single point of failure, or you can create a load balancer and go off, which I'll talk about here. Um, and just to give you an idea of pricing, because their pricing is very ambiguous on the site. Uh, these are in the cloud. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> definitely, because they give you per hour cost, like 0 0.02 per hour, and then this much for traffic and everything else. Um, what it comes down to is approximately uh, $200 a year for micro, $3,100 a year for a large, and $6,100 for an extra large. Or if you get reserved, uh, $150 a year, $2,000 a year, and $4,000 a year with this much up front. I added that into the total cost. So, uh, so you can see it cuts down the per year cost dramatically if you get it reserved, but you do have to pay more upfront, like for extra large, you have to pay $1,820 upfront, so for most people that would be out of their ballpark. Uh, if you're running a hosting company or something like that, that would seem small when you'd be like, yeah, sign me up. Um, but 
generally you'd probably get I'd say if you're a really big site that gets a lot of traffic, you'd get a large probably. Uh, it, but you can start off on a micro, just play with it. They even give away a free reserved instance. Uh, I think they're still doing that for uh, a micro instance that you can just set up and run for a year for free, uh, or for their reserved instance rate for free for that amount, which is uh, 150 dollars. Well, yeah, 100 a hundred dollars a year, I guess, if you since you don't pay the upfront reserve. Uh, something around that, which is pretty reasonable since that's less than, what, a uh, dollar a month. So that's really not that much, or $10 a month. I don't know. Uh, one thing they added to the cloud, which really made it possible for us and other people to use it, is they added plastic block storage, which basically means that you get a persistent disk that you can write your... Uh, files to, like your whole entire system to, uh, that you can attach and detach from servers and instances. Uh, and before that, if you rebooted your server, for instance, you might lose all file changes, which would be horrible because you wouldn't have them stored them somewhere where they were persistent, basically. Uh, and also, with EBS, you can snapshot your volume or create more volumes and attach them to your your instance. And what snapshotting lets you do is make a quick backup of it and you can even script that uh, so that you can just have a very simple backup system if you wanted to. Um, and uh, I'll just go here really quick. This is their console, their web console, uh, just so you can See in action. You can see we have various instances running, an extra large, and a bunch of micros. Um, and if you go over to volumes, see all our volumes for all our disks. And then in snapshots, you can see that we actually have a backup system running that keeps, uh, I think, seven days of backups for all our servers. Uh, just on the cloud, so we're not transferring it anywhere, we're not doing anything like that. You do pay a little bit amount of money for this, but most it's pretty negligible. I think, like, I don't know, a dollar a month or something like that, depending on how big and how many disks you keep. Uh, and the other part of it is the AMI or Amazon machine image, which is what you use as your to launch your instance. Uh, it's basically the install for your instance, and you can make an AMI from a running instance and share that or use that again. So if you want to make a clone of a server, that's how you do it. You just make an instant a copy of that. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to set up a, a, a micro instance using uh, Ubuntu just because it's quick and easy for me. Uh, and they also give us a cool tool to find our AMI here. So if I go into uh, cloud.ubuntu.com slash AMI, they give me a list of all their different AMIs out there for EC2. Uh, ours is hosted in the US East zone. I want, how about Natty? We want to, and I want a 64 bit. And I want EBS. So that tells me, okay, you get one of these two. I'm just going to get plain EBS. So this is my AMI ID. And if you were all set up, you could even launch it using a command line here and just quickly run off and spout off your uh, servers, but I'm just going to do it all from here so you can see it happening. Um, so choose an AMI, I'm going to go to a community AMI and enter in this code from Ubuntu. And once it's done parsing through all the AMIs available, it will give me a selection and it takes a minute. Yeah, those are the official Ubuntu managed AMIs. So you know there's no nothing tricky going on, nothing questionable going on, just a base install of Ubuntu. So that's why I like those. There we go. And then you select that you want that one to verify it's what you want.
I don't know if this is the internet here or what, but it's still pretty slow. All right, number of instances. I want to be in the same instance as my other ones. Uh, I'm going to just choose the micro because it's very cheap, but you could go, so I say, like really far up, like 20 ECUs and eight cores and seven gigs of, or 68 gigs of memory. Uh, normally, you don't need that much for most sites. Yeah, you can go really high up and get insane servers running if you needed to for some reason. Uh, generally, for Drupal, you shouldn't need that large of an instance. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on this page, it just asks you kernel ID. You can just use the default and the RAM, same thing. Uh, they offer monitoring, but they give you free monitoring, so I don't really need to pay for it. Um, you could put in your user data here, but we're just going to skip over all that. Uh, and we can give it a name. I'll call it uh, Drupal, Drupal, Drupal Camp LA. And you can either use an existing key pair, but I'll create a new one just to show you. The key pair is is it's how you authenticate the first time, at least, or all the time if you wanted to, to the instance how you connect. Uh, they do this because you don't have a password on there yet, and they, so you want to have some way of securely connecting without everyone being able to connect. Uh, I'm going to name this Drupal Camp and create a key there, and that will give me a download here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it, and that's why they do it, because it would be dangerous, mm -hmm. even if you did know the password to have it on there immediately. Yeah. That's the first thing I turn on. Yeah, that is the first thing I would turn off if they gave me root. I'm like, no. Uh, you can select a security group, which is basically just a firewall rule. Uh, probably before you even get to this point, you want to go into your security group, just make sure you have port 80. 443 and uh, probably SSH 422 open so that you can get into your server. Uh, but as long as you, you can't change which security group you're in after you start your instance, but you can change the rules in that security group. So you can change your firewall rules after, but if you wanted to have separate rules for different servers, you'd want to do that before. Uh, just reviewing it looks good. And then you just press launch, and it will. Uh, I didn't even read it. I did straight out, so I don't know. Uh, generally, I figure they stop them. Uh, maybe shut down behavior, delete the instance is one of the options. I don't know. Then you got to wait a minute for it to launch, but it doesn't really take that long. Uh, let's refresh this page. It's already launched. Um, so we have our basic instance running now. One thing we're going to want to do is give it an elastic IP, IP most likely, uh, so that you have a static IP address that you can just direct your DNS to and have your web server up. Uh, and that, that will also give you an Amazon DNS entry. Uh, before you do that, you can still access it using their private DNS entry. Uh, for SSH and things, but they don't, you don't have an IP address, really. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if you want to say, you save, yeah, it doesn't charge you for internal bandwidth, uh, but if you, but if you want to have a DNS entry or an IP address, then you definitely want to do that for just for that, but then you can save by, by going internal. Uh, it doesn't cost much for bandwidth anyway, but it does, if you're doing like a huge transfer of stuff, it would, would save you a little money. Um, so on this, I'm just going to make an elastic IP just so we have it. Um, yes, I want to make one for EC2. And I will associate it to Drupal Camp LA. And there we go, I've got my IP address right here, which it'll actually tell me on this page too. 
once it finishes loading. Uh, it tells you well, basically all the information about this instance here, including your your now private DNS and or pri private IP address, and should show me my public, yeah, Elastic IP here. Uh, as well as you can see monitoring. Nothing's happened yet, so uh, for some reason it's saying I'm loading. Uh, something there. Uh, and then security groups, I'll show you that too really quick, just so you can see the setup, how you do that. It's pretty simple. You just create a new rule, and it even gives you pre presets for like HTTP, SSH, uh, HTTPS, SMTP if you need it, MySQL if you need it. Uh, if you're doing Windows, you need like RDS and things like that. And then it just lists them all over here, and you can delete it or add more on the fly. Uh, then the other thing I want to do probably just to show you is that if we wanted to create a volume, actually I probably won't create one fully, but if you go into create a volume, you can say how, much, how many gigabytes or terabytes do I want. Um, if you're crazy and you want to go bankrupt, you could do like 3,000 terabytes. Um, and one thing to note though is you do want to make sure you're keeping everything in the same zone. Is not only will it speed everything up if, you, if it's in the same zone, but it will cost less because they charge for inter-zone communication a little bit more, I think. Uh, and then on the snapshots, you can choose a snapshot if you have one and use that for your, to create this volume. Or you can go from the snapshot page and create a volume from that. Uh, let's see if I have anything on my monitoring yet. I don't think I will because I haven't used this. Yeah. But it tells you the CPU, disk, disk activity, network activity, and if you pay for more, you get that one minute intervals and more information. But uh, I'm not going to do that for this because this is just an example. All right. So we did all of this, we launched our instance. Uh, now all that's left is to SSH in and CRD server. Uh, it'll actually give you instructions on how to do that on this page. If you say connect, it says open your SSH client, putty, or your terminal. Uh, get your private key that you downloaded before. By the way, don't lose that because you won't be able to connect after you lose that. Uh, although you could probably download it again. just annoying to find again uh, and connect and they even give you the whole command line to do it which I don't want to do from where my pen is alright and it doesn't have correct permissions which is another thing I tell you right here All right, and then I'm connected to my server. And it's just a full, whatever you installed, you could use Ubuntu, you could use uh, Sense, you could use FreeBSD, whatever you wanted to. Uh, just a normal server that's running on the cloud then at that point. Uh, but there's nothing installed yet, so let's, we probably want to install LAMP at the very least since it's for Drupal. Uh, and I'm just going to do it through Aptitude, get a little bit more visual. You could use apt get and you want to, but uh, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to check for new packages since it's a new install. And probably out of date already. Yep. All right. Yep. Yeah, if you don't give it a command, it just gives you a nice GUI makes it nice for presenting. Um, but you can just enter in command to like normal. Uh, if you go in here, you can see tasks that are available, or you could use task select. Uh, what I'm going to install is LAMP for that. And I'm sorry, complaining at me because I'm trying to upgrade this in time. And mail. And what that's going to do is it's going to install uh, Apache 
MySQL, uh, PHP, and I think it installs PostFix by default. Uh, let me choose a root user. I will make this a secret password. And make a mistake in when I'm typing it. Then you configure postfix, just normal internet. Just kind of go with the defaults right now. Yeah? Um, you already use DNC? Uh, you can. Uh, it's pretty fast connection, so it should work. I don't generally use it just because I'm always in the command line. But uh, if you've got the the X server up on this, then it should be able to VNC in like normal. Or you can, uh, I mean, you can run Windows and RDP and fine. So with VNC should be fine. Uh, because RDP is usually slower for me at least than VNC. And when this is done installing all this stuff. We'll have our basic server set up with Apache and MySQL and everything else ready for us. One thing to note on Amazon is that they make you uh, fill out this where is that form. I didn't actually include. Okay, they make you fill out a form to send emails. Uh, beyond like once you sent like 13 emails, they'll send you an email saying you've been detected as sending emails. Are you sure that you want to send emails? Because we blocked you now. Um, please fill out this form to continue sending emails. And, or use our email sending service. Yeah, or use our email sending service. Uh, it's, after you fill out the form, it's fairly painless. Just use the normal server email. And you just have to enter in, you know, your email, your account number, which it auto does if you're logged in. Describe what you're doing, uh, running Drupal, and then just submit and I yet to have them reject me. Uh, they'd probably reject you if you were registered as a spammer, but hopefully you're not, because that sucks when you're registered as a spammer. Uh, oh, and one other thing I generally will install is uh, deny host or something like it, just to if you are going to open up SSH, you want to have something blocking uh, the large amount of Chinese and other people that are going to try to hack you immediately as soon as you open up a, a public SSH port on the internet. Because as soon as I, it's like instantaneous, they find you and then uh, you have like a huge list of people that are blocked if you have it set up right. They just basically got all these computers, I guess, yep. every possible IP combination. Must be. <laughs> the latter, they're somehow. Four million. Yeah. Maybe it'll be harder. Maybe. Okay. Minor setback, I'm, sure. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure they'll still be able to figure it out. Um, and you can actually install Drush from Aptitude as well uh, if you're on the newer versions. It's not the most recent version though, so usually I'll install it myself just to get the newer version. Um, we're talking a lot about. Yeah, well, keep it up to date. It was like really yeah, old. Yeah, it was kind of like that. So I would use, I like using the package manager, but gotta keep the versions at least somewhat relevant. Uh, I'll just do it here for now. Yes. Let me continue typing. I didn't just lose my connection. Oh, there we go. Maybe. No. Hard typing when you can't see what you're typing. Um, there we go.
I think this is my internet having an issue, not the server having an issue. So I guess I guess my internet was having issues before. Uh, or Amazon EC2 machines. Yeah, or it could be Amazon EC2 machines. I am in the zone that had that issue right now. Um, but what is that? The East 1B, which is exactly the one I'm in. Yeah, the that cheapest one. Cheapest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so now I have Drush installed. So if I go to uh, var www, which is the default uh, Apache root. I can just crush it down the Drupal. I do not have permission, of course. But I can do it with sudo. And then I have Drupal. Yep. So now if I went to that Elastic IP, actually I need to set up in my Apache, so I'll go in here. Oh no, it's a default. It might be listening on it anyway. If I go here, I can copy this out. There's my it works. And obviously I configured this slightly different, but uh oh. Then it just downloaded it. So, which means I have to configure Apache now, which I didn't do at all. So because I probably didn't even really configure PHP on this. It's the danger of doing these live. Um, that's a new instance, I don't have it yet. Uh, one thing I'm going to do is turn on rewrite, because I like that for Drupal. Um, Another thing I'm going to do is turn up PHP's memory limit because I'm sure it's way too low. And just there we go. Actually, that's right, they did up, the, up that. Before it was 16 megs by default, 128 should be perfectly fine. Um, I'm pretty sure everything else should be fine. Should have PHP and everything else loaded? All right, so. Or the other way, I guess I could do this just to make it easier. Uh, move everything in that to my root directory. That ah, I missed that. But I should do it anyway. Uh, And it will download it anyway. Mm. What else could be wrong in this Apache setup? This is why it's annoying not having a default setup. But basically, it'll be standard Drupal screen at that point, once you've finished setting up Apache. Um, I can try to get it set up here still. I'm trying to think of what else could be needed. I'm looking at <sighs> probably the wrong stuff. Yeah. So what I'm going to do here, I'll see that I go down a second, so I can actually see what I'm typing. Steal an existing default virtual host. I could just continue. Uh, 
So here we go. Normally all you need to find in your virtual host is your domain name. Which I'm just going to make this for now. document root, which is just going to be bar www. Yeah. Um, that should all be fine. And whatever. I'll just write somewhere. Normally we have our own little custom log signature running. Uh, and then you have to reload or actually going to fully restart Apache. And there's our Drupal. Okay. Yes. <laughs> you don't have to do that. I was just kind of in a rush. Um, and, oh, and I need to make a log directory. No, I told it that there was a log directory here. All right, so then you have your normal Drupal install, which I'll just do really quickly. Uh, GD. And it reminds you of everything you might have missed, like PHP GD, so that's pretty easy to install. Five, yeah. giving yourself permissions. And then generally once you set up one of these servers, you'll probably just want to stop at that point once you're sure it's right and make an AMI out of it. So you can just deploy your own server with your full setup already, um, rather than doing this every time. I'm just going to go crazy. Start the patch. Weird. That's kind of weird. That's not it's picking up that I did that. Good. Oh, it just reloaded it. Okay. All right, and I need to give myself permissions on that. Need one thing for upgrading is added another. Yep. Probably. There we go. So, and then, so then we need a database. So let's go and set up Apache or MySQL really quick. Uh, and then just going to throw security to the wind and. Use my root user. A horrible way to do that, but I just want to get it done here. Yeah, at least you have a root password. You have full control of the server. You can do whatever you want. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a highly secure server. Um, Email will be mm. I 
didn't even notice that Drupal was a fair password before. <laughs> I was like, is that Drupal? It is Drupal, Drupal. Uh, the whole country. <laughs> Something like, don't do this. <laughs> All right, now I have a Drupal site running on EC2, uh, fully set up. Now, because I didn't use a separate mount for this, I only have six gigs, or, well, actually, uh, yeah, like five gigs available to me after doing all that. It's probably more than enough. Uh, you also have your like S3 that you could use as a disk or many other ways to get around EVS if you didn't want to do EVS for some reason. Uh, but for the most part, you got your whole setup. You can go into Drupal like normal. Uh, I could probably spend all day going over how to configure Apache and stuff, so I'm not going to focus too much on that. Uh, one thing I am going to cover real quick is just kind of because we are. Drupal developers and nerds. Uh, I'm going to show you how to do AWS through PHP just because uh, they have a library out here that is um, AWS SDK for PHP that lets you access the EC2 interface from PHP. So if you want to write a module, or I think there are modules out there that do that, uh, you can just access it. Oh, there are modules that use this SDK yeah. in Drupal? Yeah, already. Right. Right. Um, but if you want to write your own code... Uh, there's something. Uh, I think there's actually like an EC2 or something like that. But I haven't played around with it yet. Um, and I'm just going to cover how to make an automatic snapshot with this really quick. Just give you a general idea of what, what kind of things you can do. Uh, there are, there are free scripts out there which do this, but generally they don't use PHP because you can just do it in Perl or various other languages. And one thing to note is, and probably also for the Drupal install, you're going to want to set up a cron tab entry for your backup and for your uh, cron on Drupal, so you're not relying on poor man's cron. Uh, at least if your website isn't visited every hour. Uh, and this is just kind of a quick script I wrote that's probably not readable at all. So I'm going to open up in a text editor. Why is this all crazily colored? No. Oh, it's formatting my strings for me. Thank you. Okay. Still not readable. Okay. Now you can really read it. Um, basically, you just require your uh, SDK after you download it from this page. Uh, you'll have your EC2 key and secret key, which you can get on your account tab. Uh, I would not recommend sharing those with anyone, which is why I X them out and I'm not going to even go to the account tab to show you, but it's there. Um, just because that is your Amazon key for like everything. Then uh, you just create a new Amazon EC2, and you can then call commands to it, which they'll describe on this page. Somewhere here. And they have a pair channel too if you want it auto updated, uh, which is probably the better way to install it just because it will be easier to upgrade. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm describing all my volumes, getting a list of them all, and if my response was okay, then going through all my volumes and creating a snapshot for each one. And that's really as easy as it is to create a snapshot. Uh, you can also do much further things. I got a full right, script up here. <laughs> Uh, that has my cool and I'll do tail dash twenty. Uh, 
Right. Or through the command line. It's in page. Yeah. So you can create an instance, you can create an AMI, you can do pretty much everything. That's what that's for, really. It's the. Yeah, you could do something like that. It'd be pretty crazy because you're creating an instance. And what if they bought like five of them? You'd have to make sure your covers are co your uh, cost is covered. But. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And here's just a quick, uh, here's the other part of that. Uh, cut off there. Uh, this is what I'm doing to create uh, or to clear out my backups after X amount of days of fast. Uh, same thing, I'm, I'm getting a list of snapshots, but I'm getting it where the snapshot is complete and the description is backup because I'm adding a backup description to each of them. And I'm the owner. Then I'm going through them all, checking if their date is less than when I want to throw them away and uh, deleting that snapshot. And I have little error messages too just because I was developing this. Uh, but it's pretty simple and straightforward really. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just uh, skip that because generally there, I haven't run into any errors on this after I set it up. Um, Well, yeah, you probably could have seen some errors at that time. Our, our server was luckily spared that, even though we weren't there. Um, but, so it's pretty straightforward. You can use it to develop your own crazy scripts that might deploy instances and do crazy things. Um, or you could use it for something simple like just creating backups. Uh, which is why I like Amazon EC2, because it's very flexible versus some other ones out there. And they also just have a lot of weird stuff like this lying around. Uh, oh, and I also wanted to quickly show you how to change your instance type because uh, that's something that you'll probably want to do if you get a micro and then suddenly you, you site rockets up and you get lots of traffic. Uh, what you have to do is stop your instance. Yes. And one thing to consider, I don't know, my server has been powered off now. One thing to consider when you're doing this, if you want to change instance types, you can. But if you bought a reserved instance, it's not necessarily tied to that instance. It's tied to like one instance on this server type. So if you upgrade your server type, you're no longer that type of instance, and your reserved fees will no longer apply to that instance. So like if I buy a reserved inst micro instance for a year, uh, it'll apply to my most costly micro instance. And But if I change my micro instance to a large instance, then that reserved instance no longer applies to that micro instance, but could apply to another one. Like I'll show you here, reserved instances. They don't really... If you start another one, it'll, it'll apply to that. Right, it's just it's kind of dynamic. They just take off the bill. Yeah, which is kind of the confusing part with reserved is you don't tie it to an instance ever. It's just like you're buying a contract with them for a micro for a year or two micros. For a year. Yep, and generally, I probably wouldn't recommend buying more than one year unless you're really sure that's the instance type you want because. The other contract is three year, and in three years, lots of things happen. Um, so I stop my instance. I can now change instance type, and I can change it to whatever I want. For CG cluster group one for extra large, and that would cost me a billion dollars. So I'm not going to do it, but it's that that easy. 
that's how you would do it if you wanted to do that. Um, probably you're just going to have micro and large, maybe extra large if you have a large amount of sites. And beyond that, you're probably going to want to load balance out your servers. If you have that much traffic that you're hitting like extra large level, which Amazon actually has built in functionality to do, you can create a load balancer that then you can name and give it a port and tell it where to send traffic to basically in between different instances. And then you direct your traffic to the load balancer, it'll automatically send off your traffic between instances. So if you have like uh, AMI set up and EBS set up so that you could just deploy a lot of the same type, same server over and over and over again, or you had like a SQL backend that was synced, uh, then you could use a load balancer on the front, quickly ramp up and ramp down your server usage basically, so that you can hit a lot of different, a lot of traffic managed through a fairly flexible framework here. I'm not. Are there any issues with maintaining session or anything? Like uh, as long as you have your, your SQL set up properly on the back end, uh, which means you're replicating your SQL. Or you can, they actually have RDS as well up here, which lets you, you pay for basically another instance. And then it's an a, a Amazon run MySQL instance, basically, separate from your servers. And it replicates it on each instance? Well, it's basically different. It's separate from your server at that point. I mean, so it's like having your MySQL server and your server on the Yeah. So you have like two, it's basically like having two servers, one for MySQL and one for Apache. So then you could have multiple Apaches. Cheaper because it's purpose specific or it was cheaper. Now it's just slightly cheaper. We have one set up on there. Now I kind of regret so it. Is it hard to set that up with no, it's really easy. It's, the, it's if you go into your Drupal settings, which now I'm disconnected. Um, yeah. Well, it's just in your settings.php, you just say, instead of localhost, you say the Amazon host. And then it just looks over there. Yeah. My question that I came with. Okay. Um, because I thought it was cloud, it's sort of similar. Um, I'm like trying to set up really cheap failovers or as cheap as I can get it. Yeah. And I'm wondering what should I do with the database? Like, like, so imagine that the one site goes down and I want to switch to another one. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, depending on your. I was looking at replication, and it looks like uh, it looks like when I switch back, I would have problems. Like, like it seems like I can switch to it, okay, but then mm -hmm. when I want to go back, I have to just like dump the database and import it back to the other one. Yeah, if if you're going to ramp up and ramp down, uh, and you're going to have different, is it like a heavy use case? Like, there's lots of possible use. And you're going to have multiple servers. No, you just. Just two, okay. Cause you could, okay, because you could look at RDS if you're doing that, like from anywhere, I think. But quick, it's pretty easy too, obviously. Uh, they do give you I'll show you our RDS here. It's basically the same as running a server, but there's no server setup. There's you know, they automatically back it up. They automatically do a lot of things for you. Um, there we go. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, the way we get around that is using like memcache uh, to store our cache in, so it doesn't hit the database quite so much. Uh, then, if you do that, the latency is pretty minimal. Uh, Got to kind of just build it for however you think you need it. Basically, I don't know. If there's a good answer for that. Basically, either you might want a separate server replicating. SQL servers, or you might want like a service that lets you ramp up your thing, uh, or you might just want it on the server and 
kind of the main server with the MySQL, and then you launch another Apache server without the MySQL and reference the main servers. And it's really depending on what kind of traffic you're getting. <laughs> yeah, so that's the issue with that. That's kind of a hack. Or like my SQL didn't even like it. So, I don't know. <laughs> it works. I was speaking, so the both of them are read and write. And when they are, so when you write a change to one of the two computers, it will then write to the other database. And then if you write to that one, it will write the change to that one. So that you can read and write from both servers. Actually, we would actually have it set up to read and write at the same time because that would require a third computer doing the rebalancing. It would just be one. Set so the web servers have part B so that they would sense when their primary one went down or something and they would start using the other one. And then I, I, guess guess if I guess maybe that could work if you're only using one at a time. Because I know that they said, like, don't do that if you're using more than one at a time because your auto increment um, columns will get messed up. Okay. If, like, two people are using two separate servers and they both create a user at the same time. And like it does it in a different order or something. Yeah. That's when it gets kind of hit and hazy in there. You gotta... Yeah, that's, that's why I, I think that is what turned me off. Maybe it's another option is that you can tell it to have only write to one, and then that one will write to the four MySQL servers, where these three are read only, and it always writes to there, but anyone who's just viewing the cycle can read from those three. Yeah, that's what you're doing. Yeah. And then if that primary one goes down, then you can have your web server set to automatically have a little banner at the top that says the site is in read. And all that's going to change all your virtual tables to MDB cluster. Please do not submit any forms. We are in read only mode. That always goes over well. Uh, Click here to enter write mode. Yeah. They probably left your state right there. By then, yeah, they're like, okay. And I just pulled up a quick list of the instance types in case anyone wants like more details. You can come off to it's very weird URLs to get here, but it's aws.amazon.com, and you can find all the details like whether it's high performance I/O, uh, how many EC2 units, how much storage, and you can go down. And if you were, wanted to just look at Crazy things. You can come look at the cluster GPU instance they added. In case you wanted to have the GPU server for some reason. For the prices that you put earlier, those were just for the instances themselves. That's basically just approximate, like because we've run lots of EC2 servers. That's kind of just after running for a year. That's basically what it'll cost you, uh, just in general with everything, because they have this pricing page which tells you, you know. And obviously there are exceptions, like if you have lots of bandwidth and go over their limit, then they'll charge you $10 more a month or whatever, how many much more. Uh, and this is their pay pricing page. They have all these different prices, which will basically turn anyone off that's worried about price because it's so confusing. Um, you've got spot instances, you've got your data transfer rate, you've got your storage rate, you got your elastic IP rate, you got your cloud watch rate, and so on and so on. They do, they do tell you the price of everything. It would just, it's just hard to figure out because you'd have to, they even have like, yeah, they even have their simple monthly calculator uh, here. All you have to do is, you know what you need to calculate. Yeah. Then when I asked someone, they told me like, oh, you, you know, this many post requests. I'm like, post requests? Oh yeah, I guess I need those. Or yeah. whatever. Yeah, it's like usage. I don't even know how many I need. How many hours yeah. do I need? Maybe 730 hours, like okay. 10,000 post requests. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, their simple monthly calculator obviously isn't very simple <laughs> if you have to fill it this big of a form to do it. They um, should say simplistic monthly. Uh, simpler monthly calendar. Monthly calculator. Or calculator, yeah. Uh, or asterisk. Simple if you know what you're looking 
Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, any questions for out of time here? Or any more questions? Okay. Yeah, thank you. You bring up the schedule? Yeah. Stop this thing too.